am Tommy Stinson from Cowboys in the Campfire. You're listening to All Over the Place podcast, where the fun sanity never ends. And I mean it. Hello and welcome back to All Over the Place, the official podcast of Media Pub Live. I am your host, Eric Pervosnik, and Jim Culver, as always, in the house. Hey, hey. I swear, I swear he's there. There he is. There he is. And also, Christine Leninger. Hello. Marty Zamora, unfortunately, MIA again tonight, but you know he's with us in spirit on this. We got another music-oriented show, folks, and I'm very excited to have this guy on. We're going to be talking about his upcoming book. This is a, a, a I mean, a, he's a music fan, a producer, a DJ, a record executive, tastemaker, all on his resume, and just an all-around amazing music dude and, and just one of the nicest people I, I think you would ever meet. Peter Jesperson, welcome to All Over the Place. How do you do? Doing well, thank you. And you know, I mentioned all those things, and you are also now an author of the book Euphoric Recall, A Half Century, as a music fan, producer, DJ, record executive, and tastemaker. Congratulations on the memoir. <laughs> yeah, uh, hard to believe they've allowed me to do this, but um, but uh, yep, it's, uh, it's, it's soon to be unleashed on an unsuspecting public. November 14th, to be specific, folks, and you'll see a little scroller down there where you can go and uh, check out where to pick up the book. And I'm guessing all other uh, fabulous retailers, Peter, uh, the, the typical Amazons and BarnesandNoble.coms, all that. Yep, all of the above. I think uh, um, the only I'm not really sure what happens overseas. I've been told to direct uh, people to Amazon in, you know, a book uh publisher doesn't often want to tell anybody to go to Amazon, but in this case, um, that's the best way to get it if you're overseas for your so international Peter, audience. So Peter, why now? Why, why write the book now? Uh, because somebody offered me a book deal. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Next great, question. Great reason. <laughs> no, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it's one of those things, I suppose, you know, I've done a lot of different things and, uh, you, you know, uh, you know, I had uh, people say to me more than once, you know, you ought to write a book someday. And I'd always go, yeah, you and 10 other people would be interested. And, and, uh, and then, um, and also, you know, I was, uh, you know, I, I just have worked, you know, all the time, often more than one job at a time. And so I, I just thought, well, to do a book, you know, I'd have to drop all this stuff and I can't do that. And uh, I don't want to do that. So um, and anyway, when somebody actually offered me the deal, uh, I had been working at a label called New West Records for 17 years, left there in 2016 and was doing freelance stuff and having a grand old time, um, not making as much money, but loving it. And, uh, and then all of a sudden in the spring of 2018, I got an email from a gentleman and a publisher who said, we're interested in, um, the possibility of you writing a memoir. What do you think? And I was... You know, I didn't know what to think for sure uh, at first, rather. And um, so finally, I, I just uh, I think after, you know, the, the kind of lurching back and forth from, yes, I can do this to who am I kidding? I can't write a book and everything in between. I finally just said, wait, somebody's offered me this. I'm, you know, at the point in my life where really looking back and trying to put all this stuff down, even if it's nothing more than an elaborate memoir for my boy. Um, I, I felt like it was time to do that. And it was just sort of like, um, it just landed in my lap at the right time. Year of, of clearing my desk, you know, because I had a bunch of projects on deck and I said, I can't do this until I can, you know, just concentrate on it. And, and I, I wanted to do it as a writer. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to go to work writing every day, like I used to do doing other things. So, um, so I waited until I had, a, 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 you know, finished up the projects that were in motion. And then I said, okay, I'm diving in and I did. And you've got a half century and then some of stories in the book. How did you determine which ones to tell and which ones hopefully to leave for a volume two? Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, being a first time author. I've written a lot of stuff, you know, and I love to write. I get a buzz from writing like I do from music in some ways. I, I kind of am just a two track person. I listen to music and I read, uh, you know, those are my, uh, you know, they've been my kind of obsessions all my life. But um I think that uh, um, it was it, it was uh, to to determine what I wanted to write was 
Um, I, I mean, I had to just uh, sort of pick the logical subjects. There was a record store that I was at for 10 years that had to be in there. Um, there was uh, a, during that time, we started a record label. And also during that time, I started spinning records at a punk rock club downtown Minneapolis. And that had to be there. So all these things kind of, you know, so I just made a list of what I thought had to be written about. And then I thought, OK, well, we need a, an introduction that's going to tell how I got to, you know, the first gig at the record store. And uh, so I talked about like really, you know, just how music first came into my life and, you know, just assembled it as best I could. And uh, and, and then, you know, when I really got into, uh, you know, working with an editor, um, which I needed desperately, I'm a king digressor. And um, also a lot of the stories that I was writing about overlapped, you know, the record store overlapped with the replacements who overlapped with Twin Tone, who overlapped with the Longhorn and all these things. And so uh, I needed an expert to really help me position these things and figure out if I'm writing a chapter about or folk, you know, at the same time, I was also at the club spinning records. And how do you make all that work without it being confusing for somebody? I don't know. So it's it was some. Um, I, I, great editor and and just trying to pick the the things that seemed like the the stuff that I needed to write about. Well, it was definitely a fun read, and you know, and I've I've known you for gosh almost twenty years now. Meeting you when uh, I was doing some street street uh, stuff uh, over at New West, right? And just being able to sit down and listen to stories uh, from you know all the one most of which pop up in the book. Uh, but learning so much as well, and, and I think it was uh, Tommy uh, on the the back of the the, the book, uh, back of the jacket, one of the blurbs, a reverence and enthusiasm for music just throughout this book. And another thing I learned from the book is all the lifelong friendships you've made at, in every walk of life, and all the jobs that you mentioned, and but uh, in the list of people that you were thanking, just what was it like connecting with some of those people that you you hadn't talked to in a while? That was really one of the most rewarding things about the whole process. And and uh, my wife, Jennifer, will uh, testify to that. Um, you know, I was talking to people that I exactly, as you say, hadn't spoken to in 40 years uh, in some cases. And uh, it was it was um, an amazing experience and, and um, very interesting at this point in my life uh, too to, you know, uh, have to deal with memory so much and other people that were you know that i ran with back in the day and were in the same age group same same age bracket and and different people remember different things and some people remember very little and others remember a lot and you know i've got gigantic holes in my memory so it would be like talking to somebody and saying i remember this and this and this but i don't remember how we got from here to here and they'd kind of fill in a blank from time to time sometimes they wouldn't remember either you know i mean is that you probably saw the the, the Beatles anthology where they got the three living mm -hmm. Beatles together, where they talked about, I forget the exact story, but they all remembered a particular incident, three completely different ways. And, you know, that's, that's really, it's, it's, it's shocking to me how memory works. I remember reading a, a, a book uh, when I was a, maybe late teens, um, uh, autobiography by a, a guy named Alfred Jari, who invented the character Pear Ubu. Um, in in French literature, and he uh, and he wrote the whole first chapter of. Um, uh, actually, no, it wasn't Alfred Jarry. It was Louis Bunuel, a filmmaker. But anyway, I'm not telling the story very well. But uh, Louis Bunuel's uh, uh, autobiography, the first chapter, is called Memory, and he talks about the age that he was at and losing his memory. And he said a horrifying thing that stuck with me all my life. He said, "Losing your memory is is it makes it as if you never lived at all." And I remember thinking, "Oh my God, what a." what a horrible thing that would be. And uh, I'm not to that point yet, but memory really does start to play a serious role in our lives at this age. Well, I, I, one of my favorite quotes from Tennessee Williams, uh, among many great quotes from that guy, is our memories are best preserved in the songs that we listen to as we get older, or as we, as we live, our memories are best preserved that way. And you just, this book, and it was also uh, Bob Mayer just saying that it was written with a fan's passion and a tastemaker's discernment. All the things that you've done uh, in your half century, 
the music fan, producer, DJ, record exec, and tastemaker. What's been your favorite of those? And because and, and, they're all they all are under that umbrella of music. You know, I think I, I I mean, I was lucky to work with stuff uh, pretty much at all times that I really, really loved. But I suppose the thing that maybe I felt I was best at and maybe the thing that I liked the most was the record store. I mean, that was 10 years. And I mean, you know, you often think, God, that was a great time. And I didn't really realize at the time how great it was. I mean, at that whole period of the record store, it was like I just knew this was, you know, a, a period of my life that I was never going to forget and that I was going to, you know, um, you know, I was going to be happy that I had experienced for the rest of my life. And it certainly informed, you know, so many of the things that I ended up doing. So it was very important. It was like my college, really. It was like a 10 year, yeah. you know, 10 year college course. And it's every that mellow maniac's that. dream to, to work at a record store. And you, you got to live that. And it's, that was and if I'm remembering the chronology right, you, you went from working at the Guthrie, which as a, as a former theater guy, you worked at the Guthrie, damn. Uh, yeah. And then uh, then there was the brief foray with the college and the, and the DJing and then that, that a year or so of that, right? And then and the, then the record store popped up, right? Well, yeah, I didn't. I mean, the, the radio stuff was, um, I went to radio school while I was working at Orfolk and then I started working in radio uh, and I would do a, an overnight shift and work at Poor Folk in yeah. the afternoon to closing. And, you know, I just did that in this endless cycle. I didn't have any kind of social life really during that time. I just worked all the time. But there was it was great stuff. I mean, it was such a stimulating, um, you know, uh, I, I had two nearly full time jobs and I loved both of them. So I wasn't going to drop one because I was too busy and I didn't, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, at that age, you know, you, you're not you know, you don't mind working all the time. I mean, I guess I, I still kind of work all the time. So, um, but anyway, <laughs> I love to work. And, and now we're seeing, we, we mentioned in the pre-show that your son, Audrey, is just all bipping all over the place, a, a, a drive and all, and just, again, being surrounded by music. And uh, I don't want to give too much of the structure of the book away, but there's something that Autry mentioned to you when he was young, well, 11, maybe 12 yeah. years old when you guys were out 11. on the show. Yeah. And, uh, Music is a feeling we don't get from anything else. And that is definitely a, a thread throughout the entire book. And just, it comes across it. And you're, you you are the guru. <laughs> and so, I mean, and, and how, how did you pass that down to Autry where, where I, I get one, like I said, the book from the mouths of babes and, and he just got it from such an early age. And how did you instill that in him? I, you know, we didn't try. I mean, we didn't discourage him or encourage him, really. It was just he was surrounded by music, uh, you know, all of his life. Um, uh, you know, we we we, uh, we joke about it sometimes that maybe he came out so uh, unusual because uh, I was um, uh, the day when he before we'd even taken him home from the hospital after we got things basically settled and I could run out and get some work done. Uh, we were mastering a, an album by Mark Eitzel uh, for New West in Hollywood. And so I would run into Hollywood and attend the mastering session and then bring some of the master tracks back and listen to them on a boom box in the hospital room. And uh, so we thought, well, that's that's going to that's going to really put a dent in a kid's uh, uh, development if you're playing a Mark Eitzel records at, uh, you know, when he's a couple days old. But um, so, you know, he was just around it all the time. I we In fact, we were just talking a minute ago on the phone about how um, he had gone his uh, he's taking an art history class and they'd gone to the Getty today. And um, and uh, so we were talking. I said, well, do you, you remember that was where your um, the first concert you ever went to was at the Getty in their auditorium there. And and he had remembered because, of course, we've told the story ad nauseum over the years. But uh, but we took him. I had to go for a work thing for New West to take him to see this group called the Resentments, which was an Austin, Texas super group with. John, John D. Graham, Stephen Bruton, Scrappy Newcomb, uh, a couple of revolving door bass players and drummers. <coughs> and um, anyway, he must have been, I don't know, four months old, five months old or something. So that was his first concert. And uh, and, and I, one of the funny things about that is Stephen Bruton, who was a key uh, person in my life and, and certainly for New West Records, he was the uh, he was the uh, second, third artist signed to New West. Uh, before I even got there, um, 
but anyway, Stephen uh, had known that I had just uh, my wife and I had had a kid, and he said, "When you get to the when you get to the Getty before we go on stage, I know you probably can't stay for the whole show, but he said, give me a buzz backstage, and I'll come out and find you." And so he uh, he came out just to hold my boy for a minute, and I remember him just looking at him. This you know the great Stephen Bruton, the Prince of Austin, Texas, looks at looks at him and he goes, he said, um, he said. Uh, um, there's, he said, uh, there's the boy King, he said. And so he, Audrey became the boy King for, uh, several years there. Well, that's what we called him. Still call him that from time to time. So anyway, he got, he was, uh, he got the bug when he was quite young. Um, and, and, uh, uh, we, we joke also about the fact that he learned how to, uh, when he was learning how to talk, he was listening to Hermit's Hermit so much that he started pronouncing words with an English accent. Honest. <laughs> Speaking of New West, and again, just in the stories that you and I have had through the years, at, at, you know, just uh, I was blessed to get all these stories at, at lunches that, that we, we would uh, have. But I, I, I got a kick out of the fact that, uh, you know, when you live in L.A., and you see all these people at Bruton and all these people at, at New West and beyond. And uh, you're actually starstruck by Chris Christopherson. I love that story in the book. Well, I mean. I don't, you know, I wasn't, and I wasn't even somebody like, uh, you know, had my wife been there and he'd walked in the room, she would have fainted, you know, from, because she, you know, I never saw the film A Star is Born, for instance. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 I was such a fan of his and, and we sold so many of his records uh, at Orfolk in the early days um, when he was making his first records for Monument. Um, and, and um, you, you know, I mean, it really was a, kind of a, a astounding how often we sold those records. I knew the catalog numbers by heart because we sold them so often. And, uh, you know, they were six digit Columbia records. Um, it was millennia uh, monument was part of, uh, Columbia at the time. And, uh, so anyway, they had, they had long numbers and I had them memorized, but anyway, um, um, it was, uh, I, he, I, I remember sitting in a conference room and Cameron Strang, the owner of new West is on my left. And Don was, who was going to produce the, uh, Christofferson record for us was on my right. And we were waiting for Chris and all of a sudden we're in conversation and suddenly I hear this voice saying, hello, fellas, or something like that. And I just heard the voice and I just, you know, it was like gave me chills. And uh, and all of a sudden he's, he walks around into my view and he's wearing, you know, beat up jeans and a denim T-shirt. And he's got his hair kind of a, a skew and uh, handsome as the day is long, beat up cowboy boots. And and we're introduced and. Um, uh, Don, of course, had met him before, and I think Cam and I were both meeting him for the first time then. And and uh, and after I was introduced to him, I said, uh, "Chris, I got to thank you for helping to pay the rent at our record store. We sold so many of your records there back in 1970-71, and or in the early 70s." And uh, he just laughed and he said, uh, "Happy to be happy to be of help there, Peter." And it was uh, it was a great moment. I'll never forget. Again, so many stories, and I mentioned earlier about you know there maybe being a volume two. But anyone who follows you on social media knows that you are still out there. I, I, I'm amazed uh, all these bands that you 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 are constantly seeing. Sometimes with Audrey, sometimes I mean just going out there. Just what keeps you going to in, in discovering new music, and how do you keep discovering new music? I mean, I, you know, it's just what I do and what I've always done. I'm just a, I, I can't live without it. I I. Uh... Um, you know, Autry and I were at a show last night. We went to see Dope Lemon, this guy from Australia that I, I've been a, a nut for since 2007. Um, and uh, uh, Autry also liked like his the, the the stuff that he did originally when I fell in love with his music was kind of a folk rock thing. And now he's doing, I don't even know what you'd call it. It's sort of groove stoner music. Um, but anyway, called yeah, Dope Lemon. And it was really a fantastic show at a new room downtown here called The Bellwether. Um, so it's fun. You know, I wanted to see the bellwether. Wilco had just played a couple nights uh, stand there over the weekend and people were raving about what a great new room it was. And I thought, here's my opportunity. I don't know. I just I love live music. There's just it's um, I mean, I like, you know, record. I mean, I, I, when I'm at home, I listen to recorded music. I go out and see live music. I just music, is, you know, all day long is fine with me. So, Peter, what is your favorite venue? Where's the best, best place to see a show? Well, the best place in Los Angeles, without a doubt, in my mind, is the Troubadour. And and um, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's there. It's uh, it's about 450 capacity. Uh, great sound system, great light system. You can uh, when it's sold out, you can always find a good place to stand where the, the sound is good and the sight lines are good. I don't think they ever oversell it. 
And it's a, one of those places I, you know, I, I don't remember the first thing I saw there. Uh, it would have been before I lived out here. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it, it, you walk in the place and it's, 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 it's one of those if these walls could talk sort of things. You're just humbled by what has happened in that room since the late 50s, you know. It's, it's, yeah, it's uh, iconic for sure. I remember reading about it in uh, Tim Buckley's um, Dream Brother book. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, great book. I mean, you know, Linda Ronstadt, Elton John, you know, uh, Van Dyke Parks played there with his in a duo with his brother in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just insane. Um, what did we see there? What's the last thing we saw there? Oh, Daniel Romano's outfit, this band from uh, outside of Toronto that are another, uh, I, I think, candidate for best rock band on the planet right now. And I'm glad you brought him up that, that, as a tastemaker. That was one that you planted the seeds with me when he was first coming on with New West. And I, I'm glad he was mentioned quite a bit in the book. And, and hearing that, I'm glad to, glad to hear he's, he's still out there, out there cooking. Oh, my God. His, uh, his, the, the current band he's got is, uh, they're shockingly good. His, his wife is in, in the band and uh, they have another woman singer. So he's got two uh, female singers on either side of him and a bass player and a drummer. It really, I, I honest to God, when I, I first saw this lineup, I said it's like a, it's like a, a, a perfect marriage of Dylan's Rolling Thunder review and The Who. I mean, it's just explosive music. And uh, yeah, they're... <laughs> They're, they'll wear you out, believe me. If you see them, they make your heart pound and your legs stomp. And, you know, by the end of the night, you feel like a wet rag. If only the van, we have a venue here that I think would be pretty comparable size-wise to the Troubadour, either Crescent Ballroom or maybe the Van Buren. we got to keep our eyes on that one because uh, the, their, their calendar this year hasn't been that good. So, maybe What was the first one you mentioned, Eric? Uh, Crescent Ballroom. Actually, Crescent Ballroom is more, I, I liken that to more, it's more of a, a Roxy size in terms of the intimacy. And yeah. that's the biggest thing I miss about L.A. or all, all the, the what's left on the Sunset Strip. Love the Roxy, love the Troubadour. I miss House of Blues down, down there on Sunset Strip. That was a, a favorite venue. Largo, Spaceland. I love Spaceland. But uh, alas, rest in peace. Last yeah. I heard. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, and actually, I'm glad you brought up in the book a show, a rare show that Peter and I were actually there at the same time, Drive by Truckers at the start of 03. One of the greatest shows I think I will ever see. One of the few shows, and I'm not ashamed to admit this, where I, I was actually, the room was a little dusty when they played Something's Gotta Give. Yeah, that was an unbelievable show. And you know the story behind that one. I, I was so buzzed by it. And I knew, you know, the funny thing about it is I knew this tall singer, Patterson Hood from, he was the sound guy at the High Hat Club in, in Athens, Georgia, mm -hmm. where I did a lot of work down there. And um, so I knew him, you know, as a sound man before I knew even he was in a band. And um, so anyway, uh, I went to see the show and they just blew the roof off the joint, as, as you were saying. And the next day I marched into Cameron's office and I started raving about the show I'd seen the night before in this great band, The Drive-By Truckers. And he said, well, interestingly enough, they had a deal with Lost Highway that's coming apart and we have an opportunity to sign them. And I was just on the phone with their manager and I was like, what? Synchronicity. Kismet. Yeah, Kismet is right. Got to do a whole bunch of records with those guys. Some of their best, I think. Dirty South. I, I, Decoration Day, Dirty South and Blessing and a Curse. I, I put that up against any triple album from a, a, anybody. Three in a row. Sure. Absolutely. And it, when, you know, Jason Isbell in the band, they had three writers and three singers that were, you know, just all class A. And uh, th this lovely lady, too, too, I guess she's to my right on this. We, we were actually able to, uh, we, music, music brought us together. And I'll, I'll let her gush uh, in a little oh, bit on that one if she, if she we wants. We already to. thanked Tommy for getting oh, us together. <laughs> that's right, yes. Uh, but uh, we were able to go, uh, uh, the first time we went to, to Red Rocks was for a Jason Isbell show earlier this year. So uh, we, if you're going to do your first show at Red Rocks, it's got to be monumental. So. Yeah. And that was yeah, just so recently, right? That was, uh, it was, was in May. It was yeah. the beginning of May. We got to see them our first uh, foray into the Red Rocks. But um, yeah. since we, since Eric so wonderfully brought it up, we'll it's share on the spot. He and I met at a Tears for Fears concert last year, and we bonded over our mutual love of the replacements and Peter, um, Paul Westberg. 
All so right. he said that he said that when I turned to him and I said, I love Paul Westerberg and the replacements, he went bing. <laughs> right. He, and that was that. <laughs> yeah. And and here we are now. So it's all good. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. So um speaking of that, of course, you're well known for having, you know been a big part in the replacement success discovering and managing them for the years and of course you know you talk about your son who you know at such a young age expressed his love for music and gosh of all things tommy was what 12 when he started with the band and yep. um he was a, just a little guy you know back then and i have a 12 year old i couldn't even imagine sending off on tour so yeah. like and you were his guardian like so how over the years that you've known him and working with the band and all of that like um share with us a little bit about you know that experience and the time and well, all that yeah, there's so much to that story, really. But I mean, you know, when, you know, the funny thing was he was the last replacement that I met. Um, I went to see the band play. Uh, Westerberg had dropped a tape off at the store. And this is interesting, too. While I was writing the book and talking to Chris Mars, I found out that Chris was with Paul when he dropped off the tape. And that was a piece of, you know, the story that I never knew before. So Chris was just kind of, you know, quietly off to like the side. Out in the store. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and um, so anyway, so I met Paul and Chris was there, but I didn't meet him. And then uh, uh, I fell in love with the tape and, and uh, he invited me to a show they were doing uh, in a church down a few blocks from the record store. Um, and uh, it was a sober club in the basement of a church. And so I went to see them. And as I was walking up the stairs to go into the church, there was a kid sitting on the steps right before I got to the the door who all of a sudden looked up at me and he looked kind of dejected and and he looked up at me and he said you must be pete and i said i am and yeah that's me and he said i'm chris i'm the drummer we just got kicked out we ain't gonna play and i was like oh okay and then a second later the double doors opened and there's westerberg had brought me the tape and he introduces me to the other guy with him and that was the guitar player bob stinson and um they said well we got caught with pills and booze and they're kicking us out and we're not going to play. And the owner or the guy who ran the club was in a complete rage, screaming, how dare you? And, you know, you got to you got to give it to him. I mean, that was <laughs> walking into a sober club and pulling something like that is um, I don't know, uh, probably wasn't the smartest thing in the world. But uh, and I hate to say it, but I kind of kind of made me chuckle. Um, and uh, and I said, well, where's the fourth guy? And they said, oh, well, he was uh, climbing a tree earlier today and fell out and tore a ligament in his in his arm so he uh you know he's getting stitched up at the doctor or whatever and i didn't really think at the time that you know it was going to be a 13 year old kid i was going to meet in a couple of days but that's what it ended up being so um anyway uh you know i mean he was a remarkable young man and he fit in i mean there certainly were kid elements to him like we often, you know, rem you know, we're talking about those old days. Uh, you know, I remember we had to always set up a microphone for him on stage, even though he didn't really sing, but he needed a microphone because when he wasn't flying across the stage in midair, he'd stop long enough to grab the mic and yell fuck. And then he'd like jump into the air again. I mean, that was what you do when you're 13, right? So hearing your name coming out of a big PA saying fuck, that's like, like pretty cool. So, um, so those are the, right? yeah. Uh, but, you know, he had those, uh, you know, that matinee idol, uh, you know, uh, face and and even then. And he was just uh, and, and and the other thing about it was, you know, people would go, oh, wow. I, I remember, you know, that was a, a thing that I got a lot of flack for. Oh, wow, Peter, a band with a 13 year old bass player. This is really going to go far. And I'd be like, you know, he's 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 better than the bass player in your band. Sorry, man. You know. I mean, you know, he's he was a great player from the beginning. I mean, he was in fact, he's probably in some ways the best musician, you know, in the replacements. Um, I mean, I think they were all great players, but uh, Tommy might have been the most purely musical of the four uh, or five, if you count Slim, you know, so. So uh, well, that's one of the things I've loved about the, the replacements, remasters, the reissues, about everything uh, is Tommy's uh, bass playing has really popped out more. And yeah. I never realized what an amazing bass player he was. Yeah. 
and it was funny because one of the shows I, I saw him at the Largo, I think it was, uh, and he was playing guitar that night. And he's like, uh, "Yeah, I'm just please bear in mind I'm usually a bass player." Yeah, and just that's the way he played his guitar. So it's uh, and and with, with the reissues, and and you of course have been in the, involved in the liner notes, going back with all the Rhino reissues as well. But what what's been your take on uh, the better or the better? Or the different sound as it was with Dead Dead Man's Pop, or on uh, now with the Let Bleed edition of of, of Tim. I think they've all been just so um, spectacularly well curated. I mean, you know, you got Jason Jones at Rhino, who's the head of A and R there. Um, great guy, smart guy, r- real record guy. Uh, Bob Mayer, who you know obviously has done. You know, he knows more about the replacements probably than anybody else with the amount of research and, and you know, time he spent, you know, putting that story together for Trouble Boys. I mean, it was, I think, a remarkable feat. Um, and um, and then I've been involved in some cases I'm consulting, in some cases I'm co-producing. But uh, I think that the, um, you know, the, the work has been really great. And I think it's shown a light on some aspects of the replacements that um, other people maybe didn't see close up. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, I, I mean, uh, the, uh, the live at Maxwell's, I guess was the first real big one. And I think that's a wonderful project. I mean, I remember, you know, when it was recorded there at Maxwell's in Hoboken, you know, it was really hard to, you know, the replacements when they knew they were being recorded played differently than when they didn't know they were being recorded or when they weren't being recorded. And um, so, you know, we had a big mobile truck. Warner Brothers had brought a truck out there and run cables in and out of the this great music room that we'd played, you know, the band had played a hundred times. And um, one of the best, another one of the best, uh, Christine, to your uh, question earlier about best rock clubs, um, you know, Troubadour in LA, Maxwell's in, in, you know, the whole, you know, greater New York area, uh, unbelievable club and one of the best I've ever been in. Um, so anyway, the thing that's interesting to me about that is um, they, even though they were t- touring on the Tim album at that time, I, th- I think the best performances are songs from uh, Sorry Ma and Stink. Um, you know, just for whatever reason that night, they were really playing those well. And, um, uh, and I think that also Bob was already a little bit on the brink of, you know, being out of the band and was not always rising to the occasion. And so I don't think that's as great a show. Um, I, I mean, I think that it did, it was nice to have a really good recording of the replacements live, but I, I think that the, it's not quite as good as they really were. And I think like, for instance, the live version, the live show we put in the Sorry Ma box set in 2021 is a much better show and much more, uh, emblematic or much more representative of what they really sounded like at that time, um, you know, in the early days. Um, so, you know, anyway, I think that they've all really well done. I, you know, don't tell a soul, as I, I always say is, is, is to me the eighth best replacements record. Um, I, I think that there's some songs on there that don't, uh, that didn't set, stand the test of time. I didn't think they were good to, to begin with and they certainly haven't stood the test of time, but I do think that the remix made it, um, uh, you know, the, the Chris Lord algae mixing that record back in 1988. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I know they were trying to do the best for that record. I think Lenny Warnaker, actually one of the great, you know, A&R guys of all time in the record business, I think might've had something to do with, you know, uh, quite a bit to do with that album. And, and I'm not sure who made the decision or who decided to bring Chris Lord algae in, but I thought that that just made that record uh, sound ridiculous. And, um, and I love the fact that, they got to go back to kind of what Matt Wallace, you know, would have done had he been allowed to mix it. Because Matt Wallace is a very, very good producer who really got the replacements and had a rapport with Westerberg like very few other uh, producers ever did. Um, so I think that turned out well. But, you know, you can't. Um, what is it? What's the line about? You can't uh, you can't shine a pig or whatever. I mean, it's like hard to, um, you know, make a, a bunch of song, you know, a group of songs that aren't strong all together you know lipstick on a pig lipstick on a pig, lipstick yeah. on a pig. there you go um you know i think that probably the, the theater guy to come up with the lipstick part on that one yeah that's me <laughs> <laughs> uh 
but uh, but I mean, I think they're all good in their own way. I, I think, um, you know, the the police to meet me one was fascinating to listen to. I think, um, um, you know, the, the, the new mix of, of Tim is uh, to, I call it a correction. It really sounds like what it should have sounded like to begin with. And, um, you know, it's it's hard to figure out why that record went haywire when, you know, we, we had so many good elements from Alex Chilton starting the record to, you know, Tommy Ramone uh, recording it. And, and uh, you know, it, nobody's really sure why it turned out like it did, but it just turned the sound. The production was just odd. And and I think I just read something uh, the other day in one of the reviews of the box set where, where they were quoting Westerberg back in the day he said, he said, yeah, when the record was done, he said it was like, it didn't sound the way I wanted it to sound, but it was like, God, we got to be done with this record. I can't think about it anymore. And so, you know, for better or worse, that's what it's going to be. And everybody just walked away from it. And all these years later, 38 years later, you know, you get to remix it. And I'm glad they also were able to uh, put the full incarcerated show on the Dead Man's Pop because yep. I, that EP was like, it's my favorite version of, of uh, Oh, gee, then of course now I blank. Uh, Unsatisfied is that's my favorite live version of that song. And it just and I have the entire concert. And I and Christine's pretty sure that her brother is at that show too. So I think that's kind of cool. Ah, oh, how fun. A, 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 are you from the Milwaukee area? area? Yeah. Is and, that where you're from, Christine? I'm from the Chicago area. Oh, Chicago. Got it. My brother Got lived it. in Milwaukee for a while. <laughs> Got and, it. and the, do the dogs finally chime in with their approval for the show this evening. That's good. <laughs> Always. Yes. Good, good. good. Um, it's yeah, not I a show without Mabel or, or, uh, or Loopy. And, but I all those shows, and I'm, I'm not going to try and do it with the same energy that Mr. Westerberg did, but everything that they've been released on these boxes, those live shows are murder. Yeah, right, right. I'm, As I'm, they I'm sing on the Maxwell's record. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Speak, speaking of, of Mr. Westerberg, I, I love the quote that you pulled from him when you're talking about, you know, just music is art, not product. And you are just so perfectly suited for, for that. And to the point where I, you, you probably sh should have belonged to a reprise where Mr. Warnker and, and those guys, it was just such an artist friendly place. Yeah. And, and Mo Austin, Lenny and Mo. And, uh, but Westerberg's aim for the audience's pockets and you'll miss their hearts by a mile. Thank you for sharing that in the book. That is just above and beyond. my favorite lyricist of all time. And just that that's fast becoming my favorite sentiment. Yeah. And in an opinion piece for the New York Times, no less. I mean, he wrote two and they're both brilliant. I hope he writes some more one day. I, I think we all do. In time. Right. And I got to ask you this. You, you mentioned Don't Tell a Soul is the eighth best replacements album. Are you still considering Sue Kane Gratification the eighth or ninth best Westerberg album? I, you or know, it's one I don't listen to at all. I just, I, I'm sorry? Or, or has time again? treated it better? The more the, the further we get from it, are, are you able no, to appreciate I, it better? No, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a good record at all. <laughs> One of the few things where Peter and I will just have to agree to disagree. That's all right. That's yeah. it. It's, it's music. Yeah. It's taste. It's subjective. So, yep. I was just hey. actually talking with a, another guy that I, another musician I'm doing a little bit of work with who, who loves the record and, you know, to each their own, you know, just one to me doesn't compute. There's some greatness on it. There's some, there's some eh on it, but yeah, it, it just, it hit at the right time for me. And that, that's music again. It, 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 it's, yep. it's all subjective. And, Back to the book, you got uh, one of the things I like about this. You're going on tour with Tommy to accompany this one for a little bit on the book tour and a little music tour, and up in, and I'm hoping that Jim, who lives in Seattle, is going to be able to go see uh, see uh, either of the, the book signing or, or or a show that Cowboys uh, of the Campfire is doing. I'll do my and best. I, yeah. I, I Jim, have, you been, have you ever been to Slight of Hand Cellars? Jim? I've never been there. It's a winery, yeah. and it's apparently very close to Easy Street Records. So we're going to do the end okay. store at 6 o'clock, and then uh, the doors are at 8 at the winery, and then uh, Tommy and the Cowboys go on at 8.30. Nice. I'll be sure to check it out. Yeah. And, Peter, I do need to ask, are you guys going to rent a Ford Econoline for old time's sake on, on the tour <laughs> down the left coast? No, we're not actually uh, – I, I mean – 
actually, I thought possibly I would ride down from Seattle to Portland with them. But Tommy said they've, their vehicle is packed tight with, you know, all the equipment and the three of them. They got a stand up base, takes up a bunch of room. So I got booted out of the van and uh, I'm taking the train down. But um, and then I leave them after Portland. They do another week's worth of dates. I go to Minneapolis and then I meet Tommy in uh, I guess I'm going to meet him in New York in December for three more of these uh, book things. Well, I still got the fingers crossed you can make it out here uh, out here to the desert for, for uh, either a book signing or something concurrent with Tommy. I, I, yeah, I, I, I would love to. I'd love to do more of them. I mean, I guess we'll see how these go. You know, we haven't done one yet, so maybe they'll suck and we won't want to do more. But uh, <laughs> we're going to do, yeah, uh, less than uh, just about two weeks. What is it? Today's Tuesday. Two weeks from Friday's the first one in Seattle. Yeah. Nice. And uh, just, uh, there's another chapter in the book that I'm, I'm sure I'm not sure how difficult it was to write, but and, but it, it gave two things to me that, that really popped out, especially the title of the book coming from the chapter that you did when you when you had to find your sobriety. Right. And uh, one of the things that one of the revelations with your sobriety is that you still had a lot of records to make. And again, that just goes back, folks, to the, the over the, the through line in this book of music, the feeling we don't get from anything else. And so how was it writing that chapter? Oh, you know, uh, uh, you know, there were some unpleasant things to write about, but I mean, it's, um, you know, uh, you know, it's, you know, life isn't always a walk in the park. Right. You know, and, and uh, I think that there were, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I didn't write about on purpose um, for one reason or another, but it just seemed like that had to be in there. It was such a big part of, you know, for one thing, I mean, and there's a, I, I felt part of me was a little reluctant to write it just because it was such a fucking cliche, um, you know, record business, you know, somebody's drinking too much and doing too much of this and that. And it's like, oh, God, not another one, you know. But, um, you know, that's what happened. And uh, it's a, as they say, a slippery slope. And, and you know, I was a drug man. I love drugs. And then um, somehow I started, you know, dabbling in, you know, uh, uh, actually, the first thing I really started drinking was Johnny Walker Red Scotch. You know, it's a heck of a place to start. That just had to do with a, a girl I was dating, and she had expensive taste, and that's where I really got drawn into the whiskey. And then a buddy of mine named is shortly after, uh, or a couple of years probably after I got into the whiskey drinking, a friend of mine, um, uh, I, I remember coming into the CC Club Kitty Corner from the record store after a, hot, a bike ride on a hot day. And I was going to have a Johnny Walker Red on the Rocks. And the, my buddy Tim Carr said, um, uh, Peter, he said, you got to have the you, you got to have a beer, an ice cold, cold beer is what you drink on a hot day like this. And he said to the bartender, he said, give Peter the cold, uh, coldest beer, you you know, the, the beer that's the coldest and the coldest uh, refrigeration unit you got. And, and I'm buying it. And uh, he added me the beer and I believe it was a grain belt. Um, and I drank it and I said, hey, this is pretty good. So, you know, I added, you know, beer to my whiskey drinking. And, you know, then I, you know, I had lots of options. And then, uh, you know, I figured, you know, if, if, if you know, some substance was going to get me, it was going to be one of the drugs. And then you know, all of a sudden one day I turned around and the alcohol had its claws in me. And and uh, that was like, holy cow, how did I get here? <coughs> so it's... um. You know, it's a, it's a weird thing, and uh, I just uh, felt it had to be put down, and I certainly learned my lesson. Um, I'm 32 and a half years since my last cocktail now, and, you know, I don't even think about it. But, I mean, I, I, I when I stopped, I just stopped. I never had any kind of issues or temptation or urges or any of that stuff. I didn't. I did a little bit of the uh, AA meetings um, right when I got out because uh, I went through treatment, and the people in my that got me well, said I ought to go to some AA meetings. And so I went to the bare minimum uh, and I was just anxious to get back on, you know, with my work and my life. And so I just haven't needed it. And I understand lots of people do need to go to meetings on a regular basis. And, and I have no problem with that. Obviously, I don't make fun of it or anything. It's just I just didn't particularly need it myself. And and um, uh, yeah, it, it was uh, and, it, and it really was. It was a funny thing to you know, the, uh, another thing that I had such a, a moment of clarity when I came to in the hospital and it really was, you know, the first thing was, whew, you know, figuratively wiping my brow going, I'm 
I guess I'm alive. I made it. And then number two was I can't die yet. I got a lot of records to make. That was exactly what happened. That was my thought process. And and then I just couldn't wait to get out of that hospital bed and, you know, get back into the recording studio. Well, I'm glad music ultimately is your drug of choice. And again, all those records to make and still still out there and, and gifting us with, with, again, the tastemaker. And I, I, I purposely, you know, in reading the book, I, I, I knew that the Beatles and Stones were big with you. I knew Bowie and was reminded that uh, Dylan is kind of your Mount Rushmore, your, your big four out of everything. Who are, uh, in, who's your 21st century or what's going on now that, that uh, as, as a tastemaker, who are, are, are four that you would uh, want to recommend to our listeners? Well, Daniel Romano's outfit, I, I, as I said before, um, uh, an astonishing, artist who can do so many different things it's just breathtaking um when i first met him he came uh, he was signed to new west by uh one of our a and r guys and uh, i was very skeptical at first he was doing straight country music at the time and it was a little sticky to me he did an album called come cry with me and um it had a little bit of the kind of cornball country stuff going on in some ways but the songs were so clever um that i i i i i, I didn't write it off but i just i just kind of i was concerned and on the cover he had a cowboy hat on and kind of a nudie suit type of thing and i thought wait a minute this do you really need that if you're a real country guy do you need to you know play this you know the 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 wardrobe to the hilt um so i was a little skeptical but then um he started making a a follow-up record which was also country but much more serious it was called uh if i've only one time asking is the title and it's a, 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 if you ever get a chance to listen to the song, the story of the song is uh, stunning. And I think that uh, I don't want to give away the, 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 the story because it's, it's when you realize what he's writing about, it's, it's really something that I think would stop you in your tracks. Um, beautifully written. Anyway, those, those uh, demos, I heard the tracks as he was, you know, working on that record and I started to get sucked in. And then I saw him do a performance at South by Southwest where it was one of those revelatory moments where, like the, I'm with, you know, a hundred people around me and suddenly the crowd disappears and I'm the only one there and it's just me and the band. And, you know, I was just like, I lost my mind and, uh, and I've just been a nutty fan of his ever since. They've actually recorded right here in the back room. They've actually, they they stay here when they come through town. I've had them all set up here uh, in the back room and recording. It's a blast. Live music, except no substitutes. (laughs) That's well, yeah. Uh, so anyway, Daniel Romano's outfit. See, there I go digressing again. I'm going to try to not do this so much. So. But they're beautiful digressions. Well, uh, Daniel Romano's outfit, the, I think my favorite band right at the moment is a, an L.A. band called Gold Star. Um, I, they were, uh, uh, it's, it's a, the short version of the story is I started hearing their music as early as 2009 when the kid was in his teens. And he's in his late twenties now, early thirties possibly. And um, I lost track of him for a while when I wasn't doing A and R at New West for a couple of years. And then after leaving New West, and the funny thing about it was, it was his mother was sending me his music. She was a publicist here in L.A. Um, and and uh, she's from Vienna. He was born in Vienna but raised in L.A. And um, and she had been sending me the music. And uh, he started out as uh, God when I first met him. It was the Sister Ruby Band. Then it was uh, CG, Roxanne, and the Nightmares, and then it became Gold Star. And then I lost track of them. And then uh, about four, five, six months ago, Autry came over, came home for dinner one Sunday and came in raving about this new band he discovered called Dis- Gold Star. And I just kind of laughed and pulled out this you know music that I'd gotten in 2009 and said, here's the guy, same guy. And I said, you mean... I mean, he's still playing. I thought he disappeared, maybe gave up music or whatever. But anyway, he's just been under the radar, under my radar anyway. And he started playing shows around L.A. again. And it's one of the best bands I've seen in a long, long time. I, I would I would lay down in the highway for him. If I was at a record label, I would beg the powers that be to sign them. I think he's he's got vast, vast potential. Um, four albums uh, uh, under the name Gold Star and... Um, and a new one done and ready to go. And uh, and he's already written some new songs. I saw him a couple of weeks ago and, and he closed the show with a total punked out version of uh, uh, This Is The Sea by The Water Boys. And I just thought this is just sheer genius. I mean, it was just 
it just blew my mind. See, we, we could have used that on our last show where we were talking about our favorite covers that are deconstructed versions of the originals. Yeah, well, there you go. Good to know. I, I, I'm already written down Gold Star and Daniel Romano. So, yep, I'm... Gold Star, you got to find them on Bad Camp. And, you know, Bad Camp's getting in uh, some kind of difficulty with their new owners right now. So you better buy anything you want on Bad Camp fast. Bad Camp, got it. Somebody's already, already got my account there, I think, like from uh, one of Slim's albums. What's that about Slim's album? Uh, I think what didn't he uh, release his live album? Uh, a couple oh, of, there's like, an album called Hello, Dan uh, Thank You Dancers. That Thank uh, You Dancers, yeah, well, that was through Bandcamp, I think, wasn't it? I think you can find it on Bandcamp, yeah. Well, I, I got the CD. Well, of course, I don't have a CD player that works anymore, but I got the CD oh. and then the digital version. So, yeah. Cool. So. Yep. Yeah, his wife Chrissy put that together. I think she and and his daughter B. I think they did a great job with that. Yeah, great live album. Yeah. Yep. And uh, speaking gonna... of the the Slim album, uh, for, well, first like the uh, the songs for Slim, and then of course we uh, you uh, followed that up with the the double album, right? Of, of his two solo albums uh, for uh, yep. for the uh, that was that was for Record Store Day, right? The the double 2015, yeah. And uh, with all the the projects you've done, and, I, and of course you mentioned in the book and uh, all the different projects, that one certainly what was. Uh, not just a labor of love, but uh, something uh, a coming together of so many artists to help somebody else out. And wh where would you rank that in the projects that you've done the songs for Slim? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, we were, you know, just so everybody was just so devastated when he had the stroke in February of 2012. And you were just really, it just was like, you know, uh, you know, I can't even begin to imagine what the family felt, but from, you know, I was just outside of the family and uh, it was just devastating. And you were just kind of, it was like, you know, uh, how can, how can this have happened to a, a person as, you know, as wonderful a per person as Bob Dunlap, you know, and, um, and then a, a mutual friend of ours just sent me an email a couple of weeks after it happened and said, um, have you started thinking about the, uh, slim dunlap tribute album to raise money for his medical expenses and i went no i haven't but i'm starting to right now and uh so um i kind of kicked some ideas around in my head i talked to jennifer about it i called chrissy his wife and said i'd like to do something maybe get some people to record his songs and and maybe you know get some publishing money flowing and help you pay some medical bills you know, do I have your blessing on this? And she said, yes. And so we just dove in and um, tried to figure it out, started talking to people that I knew admired Slim and people that Slim admired uh, that maybe didn't know about his own music, like NRBQ, who didn't end up doing a song for the record, but nonetheless, we tried. And, um, and, uh, but, you know, there were people that really, really loved those Slim records, like The Old New Me, which I can see there right behind you, uh, was a big favorite of, of uh, Joe Henry's. And in fact, I remember him writing me after uh, he'd gotten the record when it first came out and saying, I love the record. But he said, the one thing that kind of pisses me off is that, you know, it's the best album title. He said, I wish I'd thought of that, The Old New Me. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought that was a pretty cool thing for Joe to say. Um, and so naturally, um, I asked if he'd want to record a track. And Joe is such a, 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 a gadabout producer in some ways, doing all those different projects with the likes of Sal, you know, Solomon Burke and Alan Toussaint and, and all these people um, uh, that I thought, you know, hey, anybody that you work with that maybe we could get to do a Slim song. So, you know, he produced several tracks, uh, three or four. He did Lucinda Williams, Steve Earle, uh, his own, uh, and Jacob Dylan. Yeah, I think there were four. And we did them all at a studio right here in North Hollywood. Um, that was an amazing uh, series of recording sessions with uh, uh, the kind of um, Joe Henry's uh, wrecking crew, uh, Jay Bellarose on drums, and um, God, I'm going to forget the bass player's name. Wonderful uh, uh, woman bass player. Um, but anyway, uh, just, to, uh, in, oh, and, um, uh, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the man from uncle, uh, TV show, but Ilya Kiriakin, his, uh, his, uh, he was the father of this, uh, kid, 
who ended up coming in and playing guitar on the songs for Slim Sessions. Um, Val, God, why am I forgetting his name now? Uh, Val McCallum, of course, Ian McCallum's son. So, so that was pretty cool. Um, and uh, yeah, we had a great time doing that. And then uh, we got Ed Ackerson in Minneapolis to record. You know, he did the replacements tracks. Um, that was a pretty interesting thing because uh, I was actually in Australia when the band was in the studio and I was on needles and pins waiting to hear the results of the sessions. And I felt very far away, obviously. And um, I was waiting for Tommy's phone call. And I still remember, like, I can picture where I was when the phone rang and I see Tommy's name on the screen. And I go, well, well, how'd the session go? And he said, I think it went really well and they were going to record one song to be one side of a single with another band right that was the plan originally and tommy said well after we did the one song busted up the slim track we let the tape roll and we knocked off three more tracks i've got four of them would you want to do an ep instead of a just one side of a seven inch and i was like well if they're all good i do and if you think they're good i probably would too and he said i think they're good you know but i'll send them to you and you tell me what you think and he sent it to me and i was like absolutely let's do this so we had four tracks with the you know refurbished replacements rejiggered replacements and then chris of course chris mars um makes his own music separately playing all the instruments and he contributed a track and we thought let's put them together we got he was a replacement too for god's sakes he was a replacement before paul westerberg was although they didn't have the name yet um but anyway um so uh that was really exciting and i would say honestly i think the the uh, Gordon Lightfoot song they do on there, I'm not saying, uh, is uh, I would put that on any replacements best of. I think that's one of Westerberg's best vocals. Um, a pisser that he didn't learn the words properly. He did that a lot with covers where he didn't really learn all the words correctly and made up some of his own or doubled up on some of the lines or whatever. But uh, but anyway, it's still, I think, just a very, very uh, convincing uh, performance. And, and uh, I like all four of the tracks that they did. It wouldn't be Westerberg if he wasn't having some creative liberties. <laughs> well, that's true to some extent, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was a, it was an amazing project. And you know, the, the thing was we put that replacements 10 inch out, limited edition of 250 copies all signed by Chris and Tommy and Paul. And we put them up for auction in January of 2013. And a woman in New York who was a replacements fanatic said, I have to have number one and I'm not going to let anybody get it. So I'm bidding $10,000 on number one. We were like, thank you very much. And then she actually bought a second copy too. I forget how much she paid for the second copy. But um, anyway, we sold all hundred, uh, all 250 of them and made uh, $106,000 to go towards their medical expenses. That was, that was a glorious day. And they're doing well. Slim's still doing good. We just, I was on the phone with his wife uh, just a couple days ago and um, you know, I, he doesn't talk exactly, but uh, I can he can listen to me blabber and Chrissy and I blabber and he puts his two cents in from time to time. And, um, you know, so he's still uh, he's still in a hospital bed and he's still paralyzed, but he's still got the will to live. It's just a massive will to live. He's a remarkable human being. And his wife is a remarkable human being for doing this for 11 years. Well, as I said at the top of the show, you have got to be one of the most genuinely nice people that I know, and and and, and doing that is just fr from the heart, and and just lo looking out for a friend. And, and that uh, I remember just watching that process happening uh, when, when when you guys were putting it together. And just thank you for doing that uh, on behalf well, of the, the Dunlap. Thank you for so, saying that, Eric. That's very kind of you. And folks, don't forget to check out Peter Jesperson's book coming out. And uh, correct me, it's November 14th, correct, for Euphoric correct. Recall? Yep. So we, we've got, got to run it down there on the ticker. You can go there to check it out and uh, go and uh, make a purchase there. And don't forget, if you're living on the on the West Coast, Northwest down to Los Angeles, well, uh, are you going, uh, how far south are you guys going? Are you doing San Diego stop as well? Nope. Nope. And Tommy's not going to make it down to L.A. He got called back to the East uh, Coast to do uh, something, a, a benefit thing. He's doing a lot of nice work for people, too. Uh, so uh, I'll just be doing that with a, a great, great local writer here by the name of Roy Traken. Writes for Variety and uh, God, who else? He's writes for a number of publications. He's really a good writer. He used to be at the Hollywood Report or not at uh, the Album Network and a uh, longtime music guy out here in L.A. and great writer and great person. And we're doing it at Stories, uh, the bookstore just down the block from uh, the Echo. 
and it's run by the woman who used to book Spaceland and Satellite and Echo and Echoplex and and so uh, she was one of my first friends in LA back in uh, when we first licensed a bunch of our Twin Tone titles to an LA company and I was out here started working out here in '92. So the great Liz great. Garrett more, more venue memories from from my time in LA. Good good times indeed with music and. and Peter, thank you for being a, uh, the, the tastemaker that you are when in the, the brief time that we knew each other in my in my Southern California days. And just the, the man has put music in not just my life, all of our lives and cannot thank you enough for that. Just being the music fan, the producer, the DJ, the record exec and tastemaker. And again, folks, now an author of the book Euphoric Recall. Check that out and look for Peter on uh, any book signings there on on the left coast, the West Coast. Check it out. Peter, thank you. thank you again for joining us here on All Over the Place. Can't thank you enough. Great to meet you, Christine and Jim. Appreciate it very much.